Yes, my session is on overview of good clinical laboratory practices where nothing much is to be taken and each and every component of my uh, lecture or the session will be covered in detail as a separate session. So I'll just provide you the overview. So in this session, these are the objectives. You should be at the end, you should be able to tell what is good clinical laboratory practice and why does GCLP exist, how and why, what is the objective of GCLP, some guidelines and standard we will see. Uh, we will also see, uh, try to understand the framework of GCLP, the laboratory workflow, LIS, and quality management in clinical laboratory. We'll just touch each one of these and detail session will be taken separately almost for all the components. So what is good clinical laboratory practice? So this is the, you can say, uh, defined as, it is an international quality system for laboratories which undertake the analysis of biological samples using good laboratory practice standards. So, okay. Now what is GCP and what is GLP? And how does how does GCLP has existed or how what is this? Why does this GCLP exist? Now GCLP is good clinical practices. It hardly touches the laboratory work. So everything related to clinical work, good clinical practices means the clinicians when they deal with patients, those those work. So it, it it has nothing to do with laboratory practices as such. Okay. And good laboratory practices are is for the laboratories where clinical samples are not run. So these are the two terms, GCP and G, GCP and GLP. But when we club these two, it becomes GCLP, or we can say it applies the GLP, that is good laboratory practices principles for reliable and valid data generation for analysis of clinical samples. So when in a laboratory, within the laboratories where clinical samples are run and good clinical laboratory practices are followed or uh, applied for getting a reliable and valid results. This is GCLP. Now, what is the objective? Why good clinical laboratory practices are important or why we should have some standards or guidelines or why we should follow good clinical laboratory practices? Ultimately, to have quality, quality and competence in our laboratory. So every aspect of the work performed in the lab should have quality so that we get quality test results. That means we get accurate, reliable, and valid results, which helps early diagnosis, leads to patient safety and desired clinical outcomes. And of course, if it is so, it will be accepted by the worldwide. Now, how to achieve quality in laboratory? Every time, like, even, I mean to say, uh, it is uh, not every time uh, easy to go for accreditation or some certification. All of you, most of you must be from accredited lab, but a few of you may be from non-accredited lab. And sometimes it becomes really difficult to go for accreditation or even some certification. The setup is not like that, especially in government setups, it becomes very difficult to get the accreditation. So, Yes, to have quality, we need to have some certification, some accreditation, like any real accreditation. Or if not, at least we can practice, we can have good clinic, we can have a good clinical laboratory practices in our, in our lab, but even without having accreditation, we can at least follow the practices, good practices in our, in our laboratory. So we can have all these things like we can have accreditation to achieve the quality, we can use standards or regulations or guidelines given by uh, different uh, organizations like one is uh, WHO has given GCLP guidelines. It is primarily prepared. It was primarily prepared for organizations that analyze the samples which are generated for a bioclinical drug, but it can be used in the clinical laboratories also. It can be applied for the, in the clinical laboratories as well. Similarly, so ICMR has given uh, GCLP guidelines. They have their own uh, GCLP guidelines 2021. Uh, in 2021, it is released. So you can use those guidelines also to have uh, good practices in your laboratory. In India, you all are aware of this terminology. It is an accreditation body which follows ISO 15189 2012 standard. And it talks about or it uh, 
Now we can say it follows or it talks about quality and competence for medical laboratories, the standards for medical laboratories. Now coming to framework of GCLP. So what all components some under good clinical laboratory practices, what all you should see to have good practices in your laboratory. One is organization. Organization has a very big role for uh, you know having it, achieving quality and competence in the laboratory. How? How organization being the head, I mean, being uh, the authority should see all the, uh, you can say policies, they have to decide quality policies, they have to decide quality objectives for the uh, laboratory, they have to decide on the uh, authority or the, you can say, the responsibilities of the people working in the laboratory, plus they have to provide facilities. So all this legal entity, they have to think of ethical uh, considerations should be there. So all this stuff lies on the organization. Organization should be ready, ready with all these things. Next is personnel. We will see each one of these in detail again. Personnel again uh, should have competent people in your laboratory who are able to perform accurately or able to perform appropriately in the laboratory. We will see what all points need to be there to have a competent person in the laboratory. Then the standard operating procedures should be at place for every technique, instrument, all those processes which you are, you are doing in the laboratory. Facilities should be there for all the things like sample collection and for the staff. Again, we'll see in detail. The regarding the equipment, material, the reagents, all the processes regarding its procurement, maintenance, repair, all those things should be in process, storage, all those things uh, should be in place. Quality audit should be done periodically to have a continuous improvement in the laboratory, the, uh, in the research of the laboratory. Then ethical things should be followed, ethical uh, things like the confidentiality of the patient and other things should also be uh, in place. Quality control you all must be doing, you all are uh, from laboratory working in some of the other laboratory quality control. You are running uh, internal as well as you're falling into external quality control, so that should be in place. And storage and retention of records, documents. Again, we have a long session on document control, a separate session on document control. So you'll see what all things uh, comes under document control, how the documents are uh, you know, stored, controlled, retrieved, changed, all those things you will see in detail. So all these are the components of the good clinical laboratory practices. So you can see just a framework of GCM. Now coming to personnel. Personnel means people working in the laboratory. Now, what are things we need to see to have a or to check the competency of the personnel? First is qualification. The qualified staff should be there in the laboratory, working in the laboratory. So we have defined uh, qualifications, but more than qualification, we talk about competence. Even if the qualification is not up to the mark, we talk more about competence. So we should see whether the staff in the laboratory is competent or not. How much experience, whether he or she has some expertise in special, some uh, operating some special instrument, some technique, or some uh, expert uh, skills he is having. So, all those things should be there. Job description, his responsibilities, tasks should be well defined. He should be provided training in various uh, things like um, QMS, LIS, HIS, it takes even uh, the work process, workflow, all he must be aware of. These things and they should be given periodically, uh, the training very periodically. Competency assessment should be done for him. And it should, it is not like, like that once we, uh, uh, and, uh, when, once we have taken the personnel or appointed some person as a technician or whatever in the, in the laboratory and he is competent and then the work is over. No, uh, repeatedly we have to maybe yearly or six monthly uh, his or her competence has to be assessed and how we can assess the competence of the laboratory workers by either direct observation, from giving him the problem, checking whether he has any problem solving skills, then uh, his work records can be reviewed. He can be interviewed regularly and we can check his competence when, whenever required. 
Continuous education should be provided to the laboratory workers in the form of different trainings. Now we can say this is also one of the certificate certificate course itself is also one of the uh, one of the we can say workshops or courses where you will get some knowledge, some updation in the knowledge you have. And this is how repeated training, maybe hands on, maybe turn on, or maybe uh, uh, like this is the one which we we are not having much hands on, but a theoretical knowledge. Uh, component is, is there such type of training should be periodically uh, provided to the lab workers. Now, we all know what the standard operating procedures again, a separate session will be taken on this. These are the documents that include a set of step by step instructions that laboratory staff should meticulously follow. Right now, what is the use of for having SOPs in our lab? Remember that when you have SOPs, it should have some validity. You cannot put once uh, SOP for 10 years. It should have some period of validity. It should have the signature of the person who has prepared it, who, who is responsible for reviewing it, and it should be changed from time to time as per the requirement. So those are SOPs which we usually have displayed in our laboratories. Now, how are these SOPs help? It facilitates the communication. It increases the productivity, saves our time. We need not memorize the steps. If SOP is there in front of our eyes, it is easy for us to perform, and it is essential for lab staff performance evaluation. Now, coming to accommodation and environmental conditions, what all facilities a laboratory should have, ideally, most of them we, especially in government setup, we are we are lacking so many things, but ideally. We, uh, the uh, the sample collection area and its transport. The we should have a proper sample collection area, proper reception, waiting room. Then it should be disabled access. Toilet facility should be there. First aid facility should be there. So these are just the things which should be available. Then there should be office facilities like. Uh, I mean, you should have a good ventilation, good lighting, good temperature in the laboratory. Check for the uh, method, any process for communication. Suppose if you want to communicate with the clinician, what is the system? Have, have you defined any system in your laboratory? If you want to communicate with the uh, uh, clinicians for some of the parameters for some of the patients reports. So is that in place or not? That has to be checked. Uh, controlled access is there or anyone is going uh, in the in that area or whether it is controlled that has to be checked workflow you need to see uh, proper space for it then the safety the hygiene of the space and obviously biomedical waste uh, disposal then how the samples and reagents are stored whether they are uh, there are good facilities to store this whether the records and the results, is there any space to keep those records and results? Otherwise, there are many labs I have seen, they are just lying here and there, and when we need to retrieve it, it becomes difficult. So whether they are stored systematically, that, that needs to be checked. Some staff facilities which looks very uh, this thing here, but it is necessary to have the facilities of drinking water, washroom, clothing uh, to keep their belongings and some, uh, maybe some uh, study area or meeting area, separate area for the eating and uh, food storage should be there in the laboratory. It should not be like on the same table where you're working, you're eating. So all these practices, uh, though these appear very small, but has a big impact. So all these practices should be followed. Coming to equipment, we should have all the records which mentions the identity of the instruments, equipments, manufacturer, who is the manufacturer, what is the model number, the information of the supplier, the instruction manual is there or not with the instrument. Nowadays, it is within the instrument. I mean, it is in the soft form within the instrument. So, it previously used to be a, a hard copies in the form of hard copies, logbooks, repair calibration service reports, we need to repair instruments many times. So are we maintaining those records? All this should be in place. Are we doing regular calibrations? Uh, which calibrators we are using? How many times we are doing? Whether there is any calibration there? What correct, corrective measures you are taking to, uh, to solve the issues in it? Or what preventive measures you are taking if the, if the things are coming, um, the um, uh, flaws are there repetitively? What preventive measures you are taking? All this needs to be checked. 
Now, when maintenance and repair and also disposable, so periodic inspection of the instruments, cleaning, it's maintenance, animal, animal maintenance is uh, there for big instruments, the electrical safety for proper functioning of the instruments, space should be available for all these things, handling of the instruments, then SOP for disposal. So there is one instrument in our laboratory uh, line since 2014. I'm trying to script. I have scripted it in 2014, but still it is lying over there in my clinical laboratory, occupying a lot of space. So what I mean to say is that the, the system should be in place. So how to dispose that instrument, how to remove that instrument, or for that matter, anything which is of, which is scrap, which is not of use, whether there is a system, whether there is any system in place. If not, it has to be there. During the selection and purchase of the instrument, whether you have done acceptance, acceptance testing, whether you have seen for IQ, QNPQ, that which accept, well, based on which you accept the instrument, so that should be checked. Regarding the reagents and consumables, whether there is, there is appropriate reception and storage area, is it there available? Where do you store? Sometimes it is a general store where all the reagents are, are stored and uh, we take as our need. We, we take it uh, from the general store as per the requirement to our laboratory. Sometimes in the laboratory itself, we, we have to store the reagents, whatever is there in the stock. So you have to check that, whether it is there and what is the process of receiving it, who receives it, whether the store people or whether the laboratory people. So what was the system? But the facility should be available, whatever it is, both the ways it works, but it should be maintained and it, it should be available. Performance verification for all these materials which we use in the laboratory or reagents and consumables, whether it is in place, instructions, user instructions are there, inventory management, is there any system for inventory management, including its disposal again, where many times we, so many reagents get expired. Again, in government settings, so many, a lot of instruments get, a lot of uh, reagents get expired. So, how to dispose that? So, is there any written or is there any uh, document which tells that this is the process for disposal of disposal of these expired reagents? Is, is it in place or not? So, that is important. So, again, it should be there. One should know. We all, laboratory, as a laboratory worker, we should know what to do with these reagents. It was incident reporting. Is it in place? If something it was happens in the laboratory, what are you going to do? Whom you have to inform? So what is the SOP for that? What is the system for that? Whether it is there or not. So when you go back, that's what is you have to do in your follow-up session. When you go back, pick any one of these. If there, it is not there in your laboratory, you can start. Whatever is at your level possible, you can start it. A small thing you can start, you can implement in a, a, a small good practice in your laboratory, right? Record maintenance, how the records are maintained, is it maintained appropriately, is it retrievable, to whom it is accessible, all those things should be checked. Now, what is quality audit? Again, we have a separate session on audit. I think we have two sessions on audit, a big session on audit. So, what is quality audit? A systematic and independent examination of some parts of the quality management system. We all know what is quality management system, the different elements of the quality management system. So, any some part of this quality management system can be done in details, and that is quality audit. So, it is to check whether it is in conformance with the requirements, whatever requirements you are using, some standards or some regulations, some guidelines, is it in conformance with that? It is to check for adequacy and compliance of the requirements, and it is for continuous improvement. So, audits are of two types. There are many types, horizontal, vertical also, but audits basically are internal audit and external audit. Again, there are first party audit, second party audit, third party audit. I won't be going in details of that. We'll be having a separate session on audit. I'm going a bit fast because we are running uh, late. We are running uh, almost one hour. We are behind, right? So this is laboratory workflow, and we all are very well aware of this, the pre-analytical phase, the analytical phase, and the 
post analytical phase and we are more concerned about analytical phase being working in the laboratories, but we need to have uh, a little concern about pre and post analytical phases also. So when we talk about pre analytical phase, it starts with patient preparation when when the patient comes for uh, giving sample. Uh, whether we are selecting the appropriate patient, whether the patient is ready, whether the patient is prepared appropriately, suppose what um, we need fasting sample, or whether the patient is has come fasting, all those things uh, needs to be checked. This is the test request form we need to check, or whether all the elements which are required on the test request form are there or not. If we know whether we get completely filled forms, uh, but we should have a look at that. We should accept only the completed forms. Labeling is properly done or not. When you collect the sample, you label it properly. You check for the quantity required for the content of the vacutainers, the content of the empty is present in the vacutainer. So what, how much quantity you are taking that has to be taken, uh, keep kept in mind. Specimen, what type of specimen you are collect, uh, collecting that has to be checked and proper container you're using that has to be checked. Specimen rejected rejection criteria is, is it there in your laboratory? Do you reject the samples actually? Yes or no? Usually we always, we do not reject the samples. Only those who are NMD accredited may be rejecting a few samples, but usually we have a like, you know, the IANA sample, so we should run it. But we should have some defined sample rejection criteria. Unless we reject a few samples which are not appropriate to run. How would the other person, how would the clinicians, how would the sisters know that, no, this is wrong and we have to correct. So make that happen, at least a few samples which are not appropriate for running, you should reject it. Then you should have a defined specimen rejection criteria. How it is transported? I have seen many samples transported under the sun. Or if it reaches me, servant room, jata hai, wo trolley leke chai by nasta vasta karke one hour the trolley is lying in the sun. So we should have a look at that. If you can uh, improvise these processes, also though we all work in the laboratory, but we can work a little bit on pre-analytical errors, pre-analytical failure uh, uh, to avoid or prevent the pre-analytical errors. It would be good. Uh, not much can be done, but we can try a bit here. Whether the samples if required to be stored are stored appropriately at appropriate temperature, proper allocating is done, that has to be checked. In analytical phase, we all know whether the procedures, methods we are using, whether uh, they are validated or verified. Can you, can you tell me the difference between validation and verification? There's no absolute answer to, to this, but any idea, if it, it can increase even my knowledge, what is the difference between validation and verification? Verification of one procedure or method or validation of one method or procedure. So think about it and you can discuss it amongst yourself during the lunch time. So we, that, uh, that is what is to be checked, the procedure, whether they are very validated or verified. Check the precision, accuracy, the biological reference interval, the sensitivity, specificity, all these things are being looked. SOPs brings about uniformity, consistency, compliance with the regulation, efficiency is increased, output is good, and we have a control over the process. These are all the things which you are very regularly doing. As a part of internal quality control, all these terminologies are very worse, well worse, well mean as the person CV, as the charts, and with guard rules, your uh, all, all are uh, using it in your uh, laboratories. External quality controls, whether you are uh, the, you are having these external any one of these external quality control ECAS proficiency testing. If not, at least um, interlaboratory comparisons, whether you are doing or not, that has to be um, seen. In the post analytical phase, again, a part of it, I can say most of it uh, belongs to us, the laboratory people only. The values which are recorded are correctly recorded. Who reviews the result? Who releases the result? And to whom the result is going? What are the contents of the report? Whether everything is properly filled, the report form, date, time, identification number, or whatever it is and uh, all the other contents which are necessary, report attributes, 
whether any system is there any system to have a critical value notification whether it is going to the right user how it is dispatched whether the patient is taking whether it is going by what boy is taking or whether our, our laboratory servant is taking to the wards what is it whether it is going to the right user at the right time that need to be streamlined turn around time you all know has to be minimum as far as possible sample storage and disposal disposal should be in place appropriately lis you all know this which takes care of confidentiality confidentiality of the patient information data integrity and security should have defined responsibility for the data access its entry change in the data and authorization of the data and even the modification of the data validated and verified systems for collection processing recording reporting storage and retrieval and whether there is contingency plan in downtime or system failure this many times happens with us we have very good instruments so instruments suddenly goes off and we become bank so what is the system for that a load of 15 uh, almost 1500 samples and 15000 tests daily we do so what we do if uh, instruments are not working if lis is is there any system is there any uh, alternative which you can work on so that you can think and you can you know document it what we will do if this happens so continuous monitoring is the key element to success in quality system continuously it has to be monitored no no you cannot say that it is done and our lab is a quality lab generating quality reports Quality maintenance, we all know the five components of quality maintenance, the quality planning, establishing the quality, uh, establishing the standard processes, that is quality processes, quality control, which is nothing but techniques, activities, techniques or activities used to fulfill quality requirements, quality assurance, which provide measures for checks and which assures you of the quality and quality implementation. So quality management system, we know these are the 12 elements of quality management system. Most of these we have covered the organization, personnel, equipment, purchasing and inventory, process control, information management, documents and reports, occurrence management, assessment, process improvement, customer services, facilities and safety. So take any one of these 12, take any small part of that particular element and work on that, which is possible for in your lab, which is possible for me. Okay. So it is not what you find, it is what you do about what you find. So we may find so many lacunas in our laboratory. This is not working well, this is not no system is there, no SOP, SOP is there. What about how, how will I report the critical values? We have so many things in our lab which are not correct, which are not right. Identifying those is not important, but having, deciding, or preparing, or making corrective measures on that is important. So, whatever things you see in the lab, try for the corrective measures, define the corrective measures, or work for the corrective measures, how I can correct this, and how I can prevent this in the future, if it is repeatedly happening, what, what can, how, how can I prevent it? Some preventive measures also is taken to be, is to be there. So quality is no more option. It has to be there. Why? Because we are dealing with patient samples. So quality has to be there. It is never an accident. Us lab ke bahut achhe results aate hain. Very accurate. Everyone relies on that lab. But it is never an accident. A lot of hard work, a lot of dedication, a lot of consistency, a lot of work is required. And then only quality comes. It is never an accident. It is always a journey, continuous journey. No destination is there. You cannot say I have achieved quality. No, never say this that I have achieved quality. It is always not sufficient. You can always work more to have more and more. And it is always a teamwork. 
most of you, those who are from NAPL laboratories, you must be knowing it is a big teamwork and you need a lot of people to work, a lot of work and a lot of people. So one person cannot have it. It is always a team. So that's it. So this was just an overview. Each component of it mostly will be taken as a separate session in detail where you can have, you know, actual uh, understanding of each thing. So thank you very much.